Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to rock and roll journalist Paul Brannigan. He's the author of a terrific new biography, This Is a Call, The Life and Times of Dave Grohl. Stick around. It'll be true nirvana if we can figure out what, exactly, a Foo Fighter is before we're through. So much media. So little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com. MRMedia.com? Stop by and check it out. There are more than 900 archived celebrity and pop culture interviews for your listening pleasure. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of guys in obscure Virginia bands who probably wish they were a lot nicer to Dave Grohl before he met Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic and left most of them in the dust in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I had a strange reaction to discovering a biography had been written about Nirvana drummer and Foo Fighters frontman Dave Grohl. Too soon? Which doesn't make sense, I know, coming after the 20th anniversary of the release of the band's landmark album, Nevermind. But Grohl is so young, so vital, so active in today's music scene, that I thought maybe it wasn't time yet because there are so many chapters still left to live and then write. Access, however, is everything, and British journalist Paul Brannigan, a former editor of Kerrang! magazine, has enjoyed a professional relationship with Grohl for the last 15 years. So, whether you're a Nirvana fan or a Foo Fighters fan, or both, there's a lot of fresh detail and insight to be found here. Access really makes the difference, and Brannigan clearly had that. Paul Brannigan, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you very much, Bob. Nice to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Uh, you know, I, this might be an odd point to start with, but one of the most interesting things in This is a Call, for me, was the Tom Petty story. And I wondered if you could tell uh, listeners what happened between Grohl and Petty. Uh, well, it was after uh, Kurt Cobain's death, obviously, and um, Tom Petty was booked to appear on Saturday Night Live with the Wildflowers, and his drummer had just uh, left at that point. And so he sort of thought about who the best drummer he knew was, and the best drummer he knew was Dave Grohl. So he reached out to management and asked if Dave would be interested, and and Saturday Night Live is a great um, sort of place in Dave Grohl's own history because it's where he discovered kind of alternative rock through uh, seeing the B-52s on there in 1980. And he obviously was a Tom Petty fan too, as everyone should be. Mm-hmm. So uh, so he took up that invitation and he played the show, played two songs Saturday Night Live and I think really enjoyed it actually. You know, it was a cathartic thing for him getting to do that and, you know, a chance for him to flex his muscles again as a drummer, which he hadn't been doing for maybe six months. And then Petty extended the invitation to him to join the Heartbreakers. And uh, and that was, you know, it was a big deal. And Dave thought about it long and hard. But ultimately, I think he thought it was too soon. It was too soon to jump into the band. And he had just finished uh, the demos for what would become the first Foo Fighters album. And I think Petty said to him, look, you know, you're this good. You've got this stuff going on. Now is not the time, you know. And uh, and probably for, for all the Foo Fighters fans around the world, it's probably best that that decision was reached. Mm. It was, so Petty's, but Petty's interest at the time was pretty serious. Um, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, you know, his, his own drummer had left Grohl. Obviously, he's got a phenomenal reputation um, within the drummer's world. You know, people who know drummers know that he's right up there. And uh, he would have, I guess, you know, given you a real kick to the band, you know, real energy. And, you know, Dave said something to me. He said, you know, people wonder why... You know, I'd be there with Tom Petty. I, I thought it was a joke at the start, but, you know, I recognized the punk rocker in Tom Petty, and I guess he sort of recognized the rock and roller in me, you know. I thought it was just uh, it was just a fascinating story to me because, you know, you think about, well, anyway, I think about uh, the effect that uh, it had on Petty when he played in the Traveling Wilburys with, you know, Bob Dylan and uh, uh, the guy from Electric Light Orchestra. I was named just... Jeff Lynn. Thank you, Jeff Lynn and uh, George Harrison, and I thought that was an electric moment in, uh, in Petty's career, in that it was just so different, and you got to see a different side of him, and the notion that, that he would even think about having a guy like Grohl come into his band, it would have really changed him up, but obviously, you know, we wouldn't have this uh, body of work of the Foo Fighters that we have now. Yeah, I mean, it would have been really interesting to see what happened. I mean, 
I don't know how much Dave would have contributed to songwriting and whatever. It would have been a completely new thing. And, you know, maybe one day they will get together and, and work together. I mean, Dave, as you say, has got sort of uh, fingers in many pies and he's, he's never, you know, he ne- doesn't understand the concept of downtime. So, uh, you know, who knows? There may yet be a chance for them to get together and days come ahead. Well, that was an interesting side trip uh, for the interview, but I, I really want to ask you about uh, to get started. So kind of set the table for people. Uh, how did you uh, develop this relationship with uh, Grohl? And it came after uh, Nirvana. Uh, so people need to understand that, um, you know, this was, this was not a carryover from, the, from Nirvana. This was something that happened during the time of the Foo Fighters. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, still in college, really, when the Nirvana was breaking, so I didn't really have any access to that band, just there was a huge fan of the band, and then shortly after that, I started working for Kerrang! magazine, which is a rock and roll magazine based in London, England, and um, and then we started doing more with the Foo Fighters, obviously, and I think expectations for Foo Fighters weren't great at the start, I mean, there's a very short list of drummers who step out from behind the kit and prove themselves as frontmen. I mean, Peter Gabriel... After that, you're pushing it somewhat, you know. <laughs> Phil Collins, I guess, you know. Sorry, not Peter Gabriel. Phil Collins, I meant to say. And, you know, I guess Ringo Starr to some extent. But, you know, Dave is known as the grunge Ringo in the British press. He was somewhat mocked for having the sort of temerity to step out and try and do this and Kurt could be in shadow. But, you know, we met in about 97 was the first time. And and then our paths crossed a lot over the, over the years. I mean, Kerrang's a, a weekly magazine. So we get a lot more access to artists than perhaps, you know, a monthly would because they're only doing them once in a, you know, two year album cycle. We'll probably do them, you know, 15 times in a two years album cycle. So, uh, so yeah, so you just run into people a lot and get to talk in and, you know, get to have a beer and get to feel sort of OK and relaxed in their company. And really, that's how it started. Yeah. Although I, there's a story in the book about the very first time I met Dave where uh, I had done a round table interview with him and two other guys in bands. And uh, I came away from the interview really happy with how it's gone and went to play back the cassette recording of the interview and it was completely wiped. <laughs> completely, no, no audio whatsoever. Oh, so I had, that, I had happened, to that happens to <laughs> you too? <laughs> yeah, well, I just had to ring. I don't know what happened. I mean, I think I just, the recorder went off again in my, in my bag when I was taking rucksack when I was taking it back. But anyway, I rang back to the PR and they managed to fortunately rearrange it all. All the bands were on the same PR company, so... It worked out, but it's a pretty embarrassing start to the relationship, let's say. That's a very kind story of you to tell right now, because what people listening to this don't know is that we tried 16 times to make this a video interview, and I could not record your audio. So <laughs> I, I'm very touched that you would share that story right now. I'm aware of the technical difficulties. <laughs> that explains why you were so patient. Um, do you uh, – now, we should point out, this is not an, an official or authorized uh, biography, but um, you obviously had a lot of cooperation over the years. Did uh, and you did a lot of interviews over the years. Did Dave uh, cooperate in 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 the, the conclusion of the book, or is most of this information drawn on things that had had happened before you decided to do a book? Uh, well, it's kind of a, a mixture of stuff. I mean, the, the book for anyone who ends up picking it up or has already read it, it, it sort of starts uh, actually at Dave Grohl's house during the making of the Wasting Light album. And at that point, I was pretty much at the end of the research for the book. And uh, I say the book isn't official and, you know, management, want uh, Dave wants to do his own story at some point. But as you were saying in your introduction, uh, maybe he feels it's maybe too soon, you know, and he feels that he'll do his own story when, when he's finished. But to me, that's in 20 years' time. You know, I mean, I won't be around in 20 years' time, I'm pretty sure. Dave, McCart- <laughs> Dave Grohl will still be rocking, just like Paul McCartney's still rocking and, you know, Mick Jagger's still rocking. So... I sort of felt it was a good time to do it, but I went to his house that day and usually, you know, when you're doing a, a book on someone and it's unauthorised, you don't get within, you know, a million miles of the subject at all. You're still held at arm's length. Um, but management were kind enough to let me go to Dave's house and let me interview him there and, you know, let me hear some of the work they were doing on the album and, and stuff like that. So I thought that was very gracious of them and very gracious of Dave himself. I mean, there was a certain extent to which it was the elephant in the room but only, uh, but we sort of cleared that about a month before when I'd gone to see one of his ba- uh, one of his previous bands in LA, uh, a band called Scream, and Dave was there, and we hung out and, and we talked about the book at that point, and you know he'd actually invited me up to his house that night. He uh, said, "Come up the next day and listen to the album," and I said, "Yeah, like management are going to allow that." <laughs> and he said, "Hey, come on, it's my band, I'm the boss," you know. So it's like, okay, well, let's see you in the morning when you sober up. 
<laughs> and then one morning I sobered up and the phone call came through and I was like, eh, maybe not today. <laughs> but I did make good on that promise, you know, within the month. So, um, so yeah, so that was kind of him. So, I mean, they could have, I guess, uh, you know, I don't want to step in any mind, legal minefields here, but I guess it's a tolerated biography. You know, management knew about it and I kept them informed. And I talked to a lot of Dave's friends and some of them wanted to clear it with Dave and, you know, whatever. So, and some spoke and some didn't speak. Mm-hmm. So everyone knew about it. Dave knew about it. And I, I spoke to him maybe three or four times on and off the record during the sort of 18 months I was writing the book. So it's, you know, while I'm in no way, uh, you know, for the sake of the lawyers listening, in no way saying it's authorised, uh, it, it has been something that uh, he's known about and has asked about, you know, throughout the process. Well, and it's some, certainly something that he should be proud of, even if he can't officially acknowledge that. Uh, it's a good book. I think it's a, uh, it, it's a fairly independent uh, look at him. Obviously, you know, you've had access and, and, and that, that was helpful. But, uh, you know, I, it's... I didn't know a lot about Dave. You know, I've I've heard him. Uh, I think the most exposure I've had to him directly is I think he's been on the Howard Stern show uh, out of New York, uh, the radio show a couple times, and and I think I've heard him there. And he always seems very entertaining. Um, so this was very good in that in that uh, aspect. Uh, one thing I wasn't clear on. I couldn't really tell. If, um, maybe I missed a big hint. But did you get to talk to Chris no- Novoselic from uh, Nirvana? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I mean, I, I requested that actually, and they're on the same management company, mm. uh, which is SAM Management out of Los Angeles. And, and so I asked about it and they said, you know, Chris, you know, is not really that keen to talk, which I sort of understood. I mean, Chris has done so, so little, yeah. uh, you know, since the breakup in Nirvana. You know, he, he's talked about some political stuff. He's talked about some issues that are big to him. And of course, he did his own book uh, at a point, you know, where he talked about sort of government and Nirvana and different things that interest him. But no, he, he didn't talk, and I, it didn't surprise me. You know, I, I would have loved to have had him in there, but, you know, I think, again, you know, it's not authorised, so it would have been a bit weird for a management stablemate to be going on the record officially to do it. So, you know, sadly, I had to do without Chris's contributions. And knowing that um, uh, Dave and uh, Courtney Love are not exactly uh, sending each other uh, uh, cards on Valentine's Day, I'm assuming that you probably didn't talk to her either. No, I mean, Courtney, Courtney's a law unto herself, and I don't want to say too much about Courtney, because everyone's kind of scared of her, and I'm included in that number. I understand. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, to be honest, what I thought was it would be, it would make life more difficult. And and I say that from knowing uh, the relationships that different people, at, friends at other magazines have had when they have worked with Courtney, and... Uh, Nothing's ever simple. It's never an hour-long interview. It's an hour-long interview that becomes six months of discussions yeah. and you know, back and forth and, and whatever. And you know, I'm a, you know, I'm 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 sort of a, not ashamed to say I'm a fan of, of Dave. You know, and I wasn't out to do you know a hatchet job and whatever. And I couldn't really see how you know there's so much bad blood between Courtney and Dave. I couldn't really see how it would sort of add to the book. It was only going to skew it in, in ways that were kind of weird and I didn't really want to be censoring her either so in the end I sort of opted to you know I, I took some quotes from where she had spoken to people Howard Stern being being one of them and you know she she's still talking about Dave just still got an issue with Dave so no yeah. I mean yeah th- this particular story <laughs> I'm afraid Courtney's doing her own book next year I believe so I guess the truth and the whole truth from her side will be in that uh, well going back to uh, to Dave's actual story then uh, I was really surprised to hear that he had dropped out of high school um, because, well, as I said, when I have heard him speak, he's very sharp. He's very intelligent. Uh, he's, he's clever. Obviously, his, his lyrics are very clever. Uh, um, do you think that he – did you ever get a sense over the years uh, that he regretted that? Is that, a, is that something that he wished that he had not done? 100% not. <laughs> he's he's one hundred percent pleased that he made that call. I mean, his mum's a high school teacher, so you know, on the on the surface of things, it didn't look very good. And there's a story in the book about the girl who sort of introduced Dave to punk rock, who he always talks about as his cousin, but actually is a friend of the family. A girl called Tracy Bradford, mm-hmm. and uh, and Tracy was at college when she heard that Dave was dropping out of high school, and she rang him and said, "Don't do this, you know. Don't be an idiot, you know. I know so many guys in bands and." you know, their life's over by 22, you know, and it might all seem good. And she really sort of tried to talk him out of it, but 
this was his dream and he wanted to do it. And you now Davis, every interview that he, where he's talked about it ever since, he's like, thank God, you know, my mum let me do this. And actually his mum went on record and said, when Dave came up to me and, and mentioned this, I said, hallelujah, because of all the things you're good at, Dave, schoolwork is not one of them. It's funny, know? isn't it? Um, I think, he'd, you know, he'd fallen in love with rock and roll really early on. And, you know, he was, an, he was a good student. I'd say his school reports, I believe, came back and say, Dave would be a great student if he would just sit still for five, <laughs> 20 minutes, you know. So, uh, yeah, he's just kind of hyperactive and he was a bit of a class joker. And, you know, he was I think he was good at school and he was smart, but he had just lost interest. By the time Led Zeppelin came around, suddenly, you know, facts and figures and numbers and words didn't seem quite so interesting. Hmm. If if music had not worked out for him, and clearly the odds are against anyone making a, a living uh, for a long time in, in, in music, from your uh, proximity to him over the years and the time you've spent talking to him and the research you did, what else do you think he'd be good at? What what else would he have succeeded at? Well, no, I think he'd be a fabulous uh, school teacher, like a music teacher or mm. drum teacher or something like that. I mean, his, his sort of infectious energy and, and lust for life is really, you know, amazing to be around. He's a really inspiring kind of guy to be around, you know, and anyone who works with him will talk about his energy and his drive and, and the sort of absolute passion he throws into everything he does. But I think he was resigned himself to, to doing the kind of regular jobs that a lot of his friends in Virginia were doing. You know, some of them were driving vans for the Washington Post some of them were working, waiting in restaurants. Some of them were working in, you know, laboring jobs and that kind of thing. And I think Dave, when you know, when it came down to it, he thought that was his future because that's what everybody did around him. There were no rock stars. I mean, there were so few people in the Washington D.C. music scene that were able to do music as a full-time job. So that even a band that seemed hugely successful, um, like Minor Threat or whatever, you know, they were kids then and they were all still at school and they were still at college. So there was no there was no sort of blueprint for a professional music career mm-hmm. in that scene where he grew up. So, yeah, he, as far as he was concerned, he was going to be working in furniture warehouse and laying bricks and doing what everybody else did to get by. Mm. Well, you know, speaking of those people that he grew up with, uh, there were a couple of recurrent threads uh, in, in Dave Grohl's life in the book. That, that, anyway, that stood out to me. Uh, one of them, I thought, was this loyalty that he's had to uh, a, a, a number of of lifelong friends who he's either stayed in touch with or remained friendly with or gone back to. Um, and then um, among them, the two guys, and these weren't from Virginia necessarily, but the two guys from uh, from Scream, uh, Pete Stahl and uh, Franz, yeah. uh, re- recur in his life. Although Pete, in the end, seems to be more, more, uh, more recurrent than uh, Franz. Yeah, well, Franz... Uh yeah, Franz and, and Pete and Franz and Dave, uh, their relationship broke down for the for the longest time. And um, you know, for people who don't know, Pete and Franz had a, a band called Scream, uh, which were Dave's sort of heroes when he was you know fifteen, sixteen years old. He joined them as their drummer, and that was his sort of punk rock education. He spent three years in a van with them, touring around America, and they ended up at a point they had problems, kind of with, I guess you know, the music scene was changing and they were changing and. It got to a point, and there was drugs involved and different things, and it got to a point they sort of wound up in L.A. at the, uh, Pete and Franz's sister's house. And uh, that's when Dave, you know, their bass player abandoned ship, went off to God knows where. They tried to find a new guy, couldn't be done. They were basically had no money, had no prospects, had no gigs, had no bass player. And it was at that point that um, Dave actually got speaking to the guys from Nirvana and ended up, you know, joining their band. Mm-hmm. But Franz, I think Dave felt a bit guilty about that. In fact, I know he did. Felt a bit guilty about leaving his friends. So when an opportunity came up in the Foo Fighters, uh, laterally, for a new guitarist to join, he picked Franz to join the band, which was, on paper, you know, fantastic. You know, Franz is a great songwriter, great guitarist, great friend. But when it came to songwriting for the third album, it didn't work out, and they had to let Franz go. Do you and think... Let... Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, they let them go in sort of a fairly cold kind of way. It's explained a little better in the book, but basically the bottom line is they let him go over a conference call, um, which, you know, for someone who's been your friend for 10 years, might not be the ideal thing to do. And then Franz turned up on Dave's doorstep and didn't quite believe it. And it all got a bit ugly. And, you know, they didn't speak for years. But actually, the the gig I mentioned earlier on, I was was last October, and I saw Scream, who are now reformed, play in Los Angeles. 
and they were playing this tiny club and Dave was literally front row under Franz's microphone huh. and would get up and do backing vocals with Franz on certain songs that they had huh. you know, written together. And at one point Franz just sort of reached down and tousled Dave's hair like you might do a, <laughs> you know, a small child. And it was really sort of affectionate gesture and, and I think that marked a bit of a detente between the two of them. Scream we end up doing a new album uh, at the end of the year in Dave's studio 606 in California. And I think now they're sort of trying to rebuild their friendship. But it's a, uh, it was a, it was cold for a long time. And I think you know, Franz is one of the few people who, certainly, his vision of of Dave isn't perhaps as glowing as other people's. Well, I wondered. Uh, I don't want to linger on this too much because uh, you know, for most people, Scream is kind of an afterthought, I guess, at this point. But I, sure. I thought it was interesting, though. Uh, Pete, see, I mean, uh, Dave joined Scream. He was basically an employee. I mean, he was. He was the kid coming in. They, it was their band. It was Pete and Franz's band. And then later, I mean, Pete managed to adjust and come to work for, for Dave, uh, not on the performing side, but uh, I guess he was, a, he was a road manager for many years, yeah, right? right? And, uh, and Franz then coming in uh, to the band to play, uh, I'm just, you know, I, I don't know that you would address this so much, but I was thinking that it, it must have just been kind of a hard adjustment even after the number of years and the success that Grohl had been through for Franz to be working clearly working for Dave I mean you set forth very clearly this is Dave Grohl's band he owns the band he you know the recordings are his he owns everything Franz literally was coming to work for him this wasn't equal this wasn't you know Dave working for him no I mean you know I think Dave tries to be egalitarian within the Foo Fighters but ultimately the way he writes songs works. That's the sound of the band, you know. Mm. I mean, it's a bit more open now, and I think everyone chips in. And actually, if you see the songwriting credits now, Dave is really good. He splits the money, up, you know, five ways, and everyone is credited, even though essentially they are his songs, mm. and everyone knows that. But yeah, with Franz, you know, it was awkward for Franz, and as much as I guess as they tried to put ego behind him, it was a difficult thing. And I mean, Franz said to me, I can't remember whether I included this quote in the book or not, but he said it was as awkward for him that, you know, that... Pete, his brother, was now working for him in a sense. So, you know, he would get off stage and Pete, he would ask for a towel and Pete would have to bring him a towel and Pete would have to bring him a drink and he was like, that's my big brother. You know, yeah. this, this isn't right, you know? Yeah, so, I, don't think that, I don't think that was in the book because that kind of kind of goes to you know, what I was asking about. It just seemed like, uh, you know, on paper it all seems fine, but, you know, in terms of personal relationships, when you're turning things upside down like that, that it, it, would, be, it would be hard. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's just a human thing, you know, it's just awkward and say, you know, Dave's not a mean guy and, you know, I think he would have loved to if Franz, if Franz stayed in the band, that would have been perfect, that would have completed the circle and, you know, everyone wins, you know, Pete's happy, Franz happy, Dave's happy, but just life doesn't always work out like that, you know, sometimes you can meet the coolest girl in the world and date her for six months and you still break up and, you know, years later you think, that's still the coolest girl in the world, but it doesn't mean she was a girl for you. Right, right. Now, there was another thread that I want to ask you about. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of people around Dave over the years uh, have had uh, drug problems. Uh, certainly, we know what happened with, uh, with Kurt Cobain. Uh, there have been you know, some close calls within Foo, Foo Fighters, although you know, it's a little sketchy what may have gone on there. Um, sure. And while, while in the book... Uh, we see that Dave, you know, he, he acknowledges that he's used drugs and, and alcohol over the years. You don't get the sense from reading the book that um, he was ever on the edge of overindulging to a dangerous point necessarily. And I wondered if that was, uh, if if that was right on the money, as we would say, or if it's if the, if it's just kind of skirting the edge of the issue. No, I think, I mean, Dave, um, I mean, he experimented with, uh, I guess, what are classified as soft drugs, you know, certainly when he was a teenager, he was taking a lot of cannabis, he was taking a lot of acid, and, you know, they were doing whatever, lighter fuel, I think. I saw that, yeah. A suburban Virginia thing. Um, So he was never on the sort of, you know, cocaine and heroin side of things. I think that the, the part of the reason that Dave didn't was, A, a sort of serious thing was he had saw a friend overdose when he was about sort of 19 and, and that was a real sort of, uh, I guess, sort of dose of reality. But also everyone who talks about Dave doing uh, doing marijuana talks about how Dave, it affected Dave like it, like cocaine would affect other people. Because Dave was already a hyper guy hmm. and he's probably the only guy who could smoke, you know, these theoretically relaxant drugs and become more hyper. So, so the idea of actually taking a sort of go faster drug 
seemed insane because it's like how much faster can he go? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, Dave was yeah. I think he just saw it. And he also, you know, when the bat when Scream were breaking up, you know, different people were into different powders and. You know, there were situations where people were selling equipment to buy drugs, and there were situations where people were asking to get paid for gigs and drugs. And I think he just saw it as being pretty ugly. I mean, and this was, you know, a very pure, righteous, liberal punk rock band. And he kind of saw a bit how, I guess, the soul of that band was destroyed mm -hmm. by drugs. And that was, you know, a warning. So the time he got to Seattle, where it seemed at a point everyone was on drugs, he'd already been through it, and he'd already, you know, dealt with it in his own way and made his mind up and it was you know he was a like he was a young guy but he was a man at that point and these guys weren't going to tell him what to do and they weren't going to affect his life to that extent hmm. good answer good answer I, I suspected that um all right let's get to the real reason people have tuned into this interview for those who don't know what the hell is a foo fighter anyway <laughs> well uh, the foo fighters it was a uh, it's a ufo that was apparently uh, spotted over you know Germany and France in the uh, in the Second World War, and obviously the, Fran the French word for uh, for fire is feu, uh, f e u. So they called they could see these sort of blazes of uh, light in the sky, and the French apparently called them feu fighters instead of UFOs. So that became the name. I think Dave himself has said it was a stupid name. It wasn't meant to mean anything. And if I'd known the band were going to do anything, I'd never have called it the Foo Fighters. So it was, it was intended just as a, a project name. Uh, I think uh, Stuart Copeland from the police had done a project a, a few years previously and called himself Clark Kent or something. <laughs> so it was Dave's idea. It was like, well, you know, people don't need to know it's me. We'll just put it out there under this silly band name. Like, Smashing Pumpkins, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> whatever. Afghan Wigs, what does that mean? Foo Fighters, it's just, you know, it's just two words. It doesn't mean anything. Just when you thought all the great band names were taken, Foo Fighters. I, I think it's a great name. I just, you know, I actually never got I never investigated until I read your book. So it was interesting to, to, to hear that explanation. And then while we're explaining things, um, why is the book called This Is a Call? I mean, if you were going to pick a, a, a Foo Fighters song, why not uh, Everlong or Monkey Wrench or, you know. Uh, well, this is the call. Was the very first single, so it was the first time that people, most people, heard Dave step out on his own. Certainly, the first time um, I'd heard an original Dave song, and also I kind of wanted to make it about the point of you know music being a calling for Dave. I mean, it might be a point that nobody else gets but me, <laughs> but my whole sort of point of the book was that Dave was a, a kind of product of this punk rock underground, and it was a calling for these guys. They were doing music because of the pure love of music not because of commercial success, not because they wanted to be rock and roll stars, but because they wanted to make music in garages, in basements, and, you know, wherever they could find it, church halls. So Dave, to me, is one of the few people who has risen from that scene. You know, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, some people got distracted, some people, I guess, view success as selling out, some people give it a shot and it didn't work, uh, and a very ha few people, you know, managed to maintain their sort of credibility and stay in the underground, and it is a very short number. But so that to me was what it meant. I said, no one else might understand that, and maybe they will now. <laughs> but uh, that was kind of the point of it. Well, uh, I've got time for just about one more question, so let me make it this. Um, for a young person who's thinking about pursuing rock and roll as a career, and this sort of goes back to what, what I, asked, I was asking before about uh, him dropping out of school, what are the takeaway lessons from the Dave Grohl story that a, you know, a young person sh can or should absorb uh, well, I guess it's a combination of sort of drive and hard work and just doing something because you love it. I mean, I think that's the key thing all the way through the book. Dave does music because he loves music. And sometimes he puts music ahead of friendships. And sometimes he puts music ahead of things that are convenient in his life. Uh, and Because it's all about those songs. And, you know, sometimes you see kids now in, in rock and roll bands, and I, and I know this sort of from my journalist days, and they want to be rock and roll stars more than they want to be musicians. And that wasn't Dave Grohl, and that wasn't a lot of the people he grew up with. You know, their their ambition was to play music wherever, whenever. Just kick out the jams, you know, <laughs> to use the old cliche. And it's not about... If people start out playing an instrument with a view to, to being a rock and roll star and everything's targeted to that, you miss out on the joy of playing music. Hmm. And I think Dave Grohl has never missed out on the joy of playing music. And that's why he's done so many different things. And that's why when you see him, that sort of infectious energy, whether it's playing in front of 15,000 people or 15 people at some private garage gig like he was doing over the summer, uh, 
that's what you get. You know, what you see is what you get. A guy who's in love with music loves making noise, and you know, maybe more rock stars should take that lesson. Very good, very good. Well, folks, listen. You can uh, you can find rock journalist Paul Brannigan's new biography. This is a call: the life and times of Dave Grohl. In great bookstores everywhere, where you can order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Uh, Paul, is there a, a website or are you on Twitter or Facebook to support the book? Uh, yeah, I think that Twitter's just like, this is a call book, and Facebook's just, this is a call. So it's on there, you know, I've just been updating with reviews and, you know, radio interviews and, and, and little things like that. So there's not, you know, there's not that much up there. But if people want to check it out, that'd be cool, and they can, you know, ask me whatever, and I'll answer whatever. That's great. Well, uh, Paul, you're a, a wonderfully patient uh, gentleman, and uh, really enjoyed the conversation, enjoyed the book, and I certainly recommend uh, it to people. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for joining us at Mr. Media today. Uh, thank you, Bob. It's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, yeah, thank you for all the kind words. And yeah, well, hopefully we'll speak again, but another book at another time. That would be great. Come, Come back, back anytime. anytime. Okay, all the best then. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For more original interviews, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Another good idea? Download our new free Mr. Media mobile app in the Android market. And you can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many parts of the Internet. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by the thepartyauthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line at 1-727-498-4711. Some messages may be used in an upcoming show. And unless you live next door to Mr. Media, there may be a toll charge. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube and Vimeo video channels. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I'm saxophonist Mindy A. Bear, and you're listening to Mr. Media. Maybe watching, huh? Hey, everybody. This is Bob Andelman from Mr. Media. First of all, I want to thank you for years of support. Uh, listening to the show. We're starting our sixth year. It's hard to believe our sixth year uh, as 2012 starts and heading towards our 1,000th online podcast, uh, audio and video. It's uh, pretty amazing, (laughs) frankly. Uh, I remember starting it several years ago thinking, this will never last. And podcasts, that's as stupid a word as blogging. But here we are, (laughs) starting our sixth year and heading up to a 1,000 interviews. And I want to thank everybody for uh, listening and supporting the show. I also want to tell you that... uh, you know, one of the things that's been very helpful for this show is Stitcher Radio. Yes, this is sort of a commercial. Now, there are millions of smartphone apps in the world, but I only use one several times a day, Stitcher Radio. I build my own radio station to listen to broadcast and online shows when I want and in the order I want. CNN News Update, Onion Radio News, WTF with Mark Marin, MSNBC's Morning Joe, Studio 60, the TechCrunch headlines, and of course, Mr. Media. It's free. It works on iPhone, Android, BlackBerry, Palm Pre, and much more. And you can get it for free for yourself. Try it out. I guarantee you're going to love it. Stitcher.com slash MR Media. That's Stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. You're going to love it. And thanks again for supporting the show.